นะครับหรือชื่อเล่นว่าบิลลี่นะครับเป็นตัวแทนของบริษัท Security s c o r e g u a r d เขาต้องรับทุกท่านเข้าสู่งานสัมมนาเกี่ยวกับการใช้คะแนนทางด้าน Cyber Security ในการบริหารจัดการการรายงานและการสื่อสารเกี่ยวกับความเสี่ยงที่เกิดขึ้นจาก Cyber Security ในองค์กรของท่านโดยท่านจะได้เรียนรู้ถึงที่มาของระบบในการให้คะแนนและการนำคะแนนดังกล่าวไปใช้ในการสื่อสารแก้ไขปัญหาในองค์กรของท่านรวมไปถึงบริษัทที่เราทำธุรกิจด้วยนะครับไม่ว่าจะเป็น supplier outsourcer vendor service provider อะไรต่างๆซึ่งเรารวมเรียกเรียกกันว่า third party นะครับทางเรามีความคาดหวังให้ทุกองค์กรมีคะแนนที่ดีเพื่อที่จะลดความเสี่ยงจากภัยคุกคามทางด้านไซเบอร์ที่เกิดจากแฮกเกอร์ได้รวมถึงความเสี่ยงของบริษัทที่ท่านทำธุรกิจด้วยซึ่งปัจจุบันนี้นะครับการที่ท่านทำธุรกิจอื่นมีในส่วนของ supply chain risk ซึ่งทำให้เกิด data breach เนี่ยมากถึง 75% เลยทีเดียวนะครับหากทุกองค์กรสามารถเห็นปัญหาและแก้ไขปัญหาดังกล่าวได้จะทำให้แฮกเกอร์หาช่องทางในการเจาะระบบซัพพลายเชนของเรายากขึ้นทำให้ทุกฝ่ายเราปลอดภัยไปด้วยกันนะครับเรามารับฟังการบรรยายและเดโมจากคุณฮานซึ่งปัจจุบันดำรงตำแหน่ง Consulting Engineer APAC ของ Security s c o r e g u a r d ไปด้วยกันเลยครับ Hi h a n over to you Hi everyone thank you for joining us today so it's a pleasure to meet all of you so what you got Uh, and maybe just a very quick introduction to myself. I'm the sales engineer, consulting engineer for APAC, and I've been with Security Scorecard for about a year plus. Uh, I've been in cybersecurity for about seven, eight years now, uh, doing more consulting roles. So I've helped a fair bit of customers evolve their third-party risk management journey. So today in our session here, uh, we're going to look at some of the challenges we have with without security ratings. Uh, we'll briefly talk about what does security ratings can do for you. At the same time, we'll cover a couple of the use cases we can do. Like how do we use that and present it to the board of directors? Some of the case studies that we see with our customers, and before we sum it up uh, of takeaways, and I'll do a very brief demonstration of the platform as well. So let's take a quick look at the challenges that most of us in cybersecurity will face. The very right key one here is really simple. We are fighting an absolute asymmetric battle with the threat actors. Often the bad actors are more organized than we are. We are sharing, they're sharing the threat intelligence across their own networks while we are still spending time as companies running Excel spreadsheets, running penetration testings, using a lot of resources in very manual processes. And the cost to the threat actors continue to go downwards, down and down. And it's becoming much easier for them to automate. So what that means for us is essentially that they can easily find and attack the lowest hanging fruits and go deep down the supply chain, get back up to where they like to go. For example, the main data uh, crown jewels, the data, whatever they're looking for. And and if you kind of look at that, it's about the asymmetry we have in this space and how organizations are playing in this as well. The bad guys have an advantage over us as well. But if we kind of look at it on a general sense as well, there's a second problem to it. There really isn't any standard about how we communicate security performance, how we communicate security risk, how do we communicate security hygiene, how do I know I'm getting a return on investments on my security program, how do I know I'm moving the dial on improving my organization's security. But more often than not, we're also seeing a lot of our vendors and partners also introducing risk to the organization. And how bad do I know if my vendors, my partners are diligent about protecting the data, our intellectual property that they may have access to. So finding that standard that we can all use to communicate with our internal stakeholders, our board of directors, our partners in our ecosystem is a really important aspect. And it's also the key element why security ratings has come into the space today, right? There's really no gold standard in terms of how we communicate security risk. The second problem here, second big challenge that we're seeing is really having that centralized inventory of all our assets, whether those are internal or internet facing assets. So when we think about how malicious actors are working, They're looking for all of these entry points, these low hanging fruits that are exposed from the outside, which pr provides the entry points to companies, to the bad actors, 
uh, to get into organizations. And those entry points can come in multiple areas. They can be your third parties, they can be our own employee networks, since we're all moving to remote work. Uh, there can be different endpoints as well, mobile phones connected to the Wi-Fi and so forth. But we don't have a common way to communicate that across to our stakeholders, be it the board, be it the risk teams, the privacy, the legal team, or to our third parties as well. And what the statistics are saying is that there's 30% more assets than we know about, right? Because IoT, Internet of Things are growing, smart cities and all, they're multiplying things really, really quickly. So getting a view of your attack surface is one of the big second challenge that we should look at as well. The third big challenge here is that we're seeing board of directors, the board level compliance as emerging trend. So talking to the board is the easy part, but trying to get them to change their thinking is at a different level. So the bots are not cybersecurity professionals. We know that, right? So we communicate with our board of directors, but we do see multiple movements across the globe in building awareness for the board, right? So cybersecurity awareness for the board. So for example, the Kotak community in India has implemented for the Security Exchange of India to take calls and awareness training on cybersecurity. Same thing, the Reserve Bank of India is also mandating awareness training for financial institutions. Same goes for the United States as well. The SEC is requiring bots to build out the cybersecurity awareness. In our APAC region, we do see the same trends as well. So in Singapore, the board of directors, the leadership are held accountable for cyber incidents, right? Despite them may not be cybersecurity professionals as well. So they need to take active actions to understand what's happening on the ground and be able to then help the organizations steer the ship right. So when we kind of look at it, and this is coming from the National Association of Corporate Directors in America. So it may be slightly different for our region in APAC, but it's been similar based on my recent conversations with a couple of bots. What we see here is very interesting. This is about the trends, about bots, uh, about the concerns of bots. So when we look at it, we saw that over the last two years, there has been an increased pace of digital transformation. Right? So that is something that's really top of mind. There's also around uh, building a safe working environment for employees because we are seeing uh, COVID, people are working from home, remote work as well. So there's disruptions, there's changing threats. That's all staying, that's all increasing as well. And one the interesting one is the last one, that there's an increased competition for talent. Right? And, and we all know we're working in a negative space of employment. There's a massive shortage of cyber trade personnel. Uh, auto, and, and we can see that really deeply in uh, all organizations. So what do we do? Automation is really key. And that's really important for us to be able to build out uh, and, and do more with less, right? So we have enough people to be able to build out automation to, to fill that need without the amount of people that we have as well. But if we kind of look at APAC trends as well, and this report is coming from the Verizon Data Breach Report 2022, so this year's Verizon Data Breach, it's always interesting to look at the motives, right? So when we kind of look at the motives, uh, you will be able to see that financial, um, it's one of the biggest for, uh, uh, motivations that attack that the threat actors have as well, right? So financial is always top of the game, but it's interesting to see espionage as a secondary area. And that's quite big in the APAC region because we have quite a fair bit of intellectual properties uh, in, in this region as well. So for example, some of the semiconductor industries uh, were well, hacked recently because Apple released a new phone, right? So attackers were trying to look out for industrial control espionage, right? To understand what does the chip look like, right? To steal that data, right? And attack those organizations rather than attacking Apple as well. So some of the basics in there is that we can see that there were basic attacks against intrusions against organizations. Things like social engineering, basic web applications and system intrusion represent about 98% of breaches. So while we see positive things happening and we move into a more digital space, we're seeing crossovers of the types of attacks that are being exploited along the way as well. So if we go deeper on this, this is a really interesting chart because it shows you that system intrusion is on the rise. So 
the threat actors are gaining access through hardcore brute forcing and other techniques as well. But there's a good area, there's a positive side to it as well. We can see general trends downwards in terms of social engineering and basic web application attacks. So we've always heard of OWASP top 10, right? things that we need to secure on our basic web applications. Uh, we can see that as a downward trend. So if we drill down to this, there's two areas that this looks at. Uh, one is around misconfiguration of the web applications, and that the other will be around misdelivery in the set ops process as well. So the misconfiguration is on a downward trend, which is good, but the misdelivery due to set up processes is going up. So the way that we're configuring our dev set ops uh, needs to be looked at. The way that we have access rights into those processes needs to be looked at as well. There's another interesting chart that I'd like to cover today as well. So this is a chart again from the Verizon report, and this is always interesting to look at. What this chart depicts is the number of steps that it takes a threat actor to gain access into the environment. So you can see of the 258 breaches that Verizon looked at, the grand majority are less than five steps, right? The most majority of them are less than five steps. In fact, most of them are one, two, and three steps. And this means that they're finding early and easy access points into organizations and provide entry from there. So those that also means that most things are very, really quick. They're very short. The hit and run type of scenarios. And that directly correlates with our cyber hygiene and the need for us to eliminate this easy, low hanging fruits for the malicious actors. So, with that, let's quickly switch topics. What is security ratings? How does security ratings work in general? How are they being applied? What are things that are, are, are used to, to evaluate? And why do organizations use them? So if we look at security ratings, the first thing about security ratings is that they provide us a probabilistic insight into the likelihood of breach. Right? They go a mile wide and an inch deep on organizations. They are not a replacement for penetration testing, but they're a good way for us to understand at scale what an organization looks like to the outside, what our risk reputation looks like, what's our cyber hygiene looking like from the outside. So again, it's probabilistic insight on the likelihood of a breach. It looks at a lot of things, but not everything, but it gives you a very powerful way to collaborate internally and externally. So within my organizations and externally with your partners, it provides a common language because it creates a collaborative uh, platform for you to engage both internally and externally as well. So aside from that, it does pro provide to you a continuous visibility from a cyber perspective and from a compliance angle as well. So what we do is that we have a mapping right in the platform. It provides for you uh, to understand what an auditor would see from the outside of the organization that could potentially affect my ISO 2001 audit or PCI audit for the matter as well. And finally, one of the most important aspects here is the ability to run the return of investments and benchmark against your peers or ourselves. The objective of security ratings is literally, I want to get a quick snapshot. I want to understand my cybersecurity or the cybersecurity of the organization that I'm about to work with. So onboarding of new vendors, dealing with vendors along the way, having that continuous assessment and visibility is important here. And if you kind of look at it from a big picture, Cyber ratings has been around since 2011. So when the first player uh, in the market started, we came around in 2013. So the barrier to entry in this industry, and it is a competitive environment, is about the wealth of the historical data, right? This is a really important aspect. So the more historical data that organization, the security ratings player has, the more correlate, correlation you can build, right? And it's important to ask, right, when you're deciding on a security ratings uh, organization to ask what has your security data, your historical data showed you and how does they relate to data breaches as well. So let's talk about how security ratings work. So in principle, all the security ratings work really similarly, but they may measure different things. So the first part is always about data collection. 
So they will collect signals like how we do as a security scorecard, or they'll go out and buy data from third parties. The second part of it is that they want to build out the digital footprint. So what that means is what are your domains and what are your digital IP asset looking like? And they'll then attribute the vulnerabilities back that way. So different players may look at different things. Security scorecard, we look at 10 different areas of risk from your network security, your DNSL, and we also look at your patching, your DNS, sorry, your IP reputation, your web applications, and some social indicators. And what will happen is that we will take those vulnerabilities, map out your digital footprint, and weigh them across the factors that security ratings use. So again, different players use different ways to measure. Security Scorecard uses 10 different areas of risk, and we, we apply machine learning as well to our model. So what comes out effectively here is that we use a benchmark of zero to 100, and we correlate that to a grading system of A through F. So A is above 90%, B is 80, 90%, F is 60% and below. And in our experience of eight years, we see that companies that are scoring C, D, and F, or 70% and below, are seven seven times more likely to experience a data breach than those of a, of, a, of a A grade. So how do we score, right? So as a case scorecard, we look at the quantity of issues that we detect. We look at the severity of the issues that we detect in relation to the size of the digital footprint of the organization. Uh, so, so we're looking at three different factors. And that means that we're looking at organizations that, for example, have 1 million IP addresses, are scored against other organizations that have 1 million IP addresses as well. So let's take an example of an issue. So let's make an example of RDP. Right? So if we have an RDP, remote desktop protocol port that's publicly observable, the way that security ratings work is that do you have more issues or less issues than your peer? So if you have more, then your impact is going to be higher. And if you have less, then your impact is going to be lower. Then we put that along a line and we then do standard deviation and look at where which standard deviation are you away from your peers as well. So what's important when looking at security ratings is the transparency of the model as well. So are the models open and available? How am I being scored? How do I know it's apples to apples? Is this being documented publicly? The second part about it is that, is there a dispute process and whether that dispute process gets addressed in a timely manner? And the third part about it is whether there's an independence on the model governance. And that means that relationships, company to company relationships, can't affect the way that we score organizations. Everyone are scored under the same model. So those are the principles that we use to ensure that we have a fair, accurate and predictive model of organizations. But at the same time, we do see a really interesting trend. So we do see uh, in this market dynamics for security ratings, that there's a shift in the market. So in terms of security ratings is initially set up to help manage risk, is to help manage our own cyber hygiene, but yet now is shifting towards the risk intelligence. And what does, what does that mean, right? It means how do I move into a more proactive stance? How do I take actions before issues are happening? How do I create value for my organizations? So there's a couple of areas that security ratings can create different shader, compared to different shader for the business. And at the same time, we're also seeing a shift in the way that security ratings go. So we're now seeing that are these issues that I'm seeing on my scorecard being actively exploited in the wild, or are they being exploited on my scorecard, right? So we are now shifting from risk intelligence, sorry, risk management to risk intelligence and how do they impact me? I want to understand what are the type of products I use? What do I have exposed out there? What IPs do I have that have malicious actors uh, working on them? Are there vulnerabilities that I wasn't aware of? So we see this transition in the depth of the information provided. So if we look at the whole market, and this is the hype cycle, the uh, Gartner hype cycle, you can see that security ratings are right here at the top, right next to risk quantification. So let's assume that APAC runs about a year, a year or two behind North America is running. Uh, we can see that security ratings are still on a very upwards trajectory, 
in the APAC region. And that's exactly what we see in the market. We are seeing a growth acceleration for our business in APAC. And we're now coming into the mainstream, especially for the APAC market as well. So let's switch track a bit. So we're going to shift over to the areas of use cases. And there's really a lot, right? So the great part about security ratings is that security ratings support a multitude of use cases from a single platform. So a lot of our customers use us in two key ways. The first way is we really to understand their own risk. That's what we call enterprise cyber risk management, where we understand your own risk and be able to take actions to remediate those issues as well. The same perspective, the same depth that you can see of yourself you can see on your third parties as well, on all of your partners. And that's effectively bringing about what we call the third party risk management journey. So you can build out your third party risk, understand your vendors throughout their whole life cycle, be it an onboarding, during a conversation with them, have a continuous visibility into their adherence uh, to certain standards and whether there are gaps in terms of the security compliance. And that brings me to the third point. So there are quite a fair bit of companies using Security Scorecard to understand what are they exposing right now compared against compliance frameworks, things like PCI DSS, ISO 20001, uh, GDPR, NIST cybersecurity framework, and so forth. But the most interesting along here is the ability to then generate reports to the board, to executives. So instead of having it from a deeply cybersecurity and technical perspective, you can generate really simple reports so that your board understands your current risk and be able to take the necessary actions to scale your organization. We also see, interestingly, cyber insurance leveraging security ratings heavily to help them understand the cyber risk that they're taking on. So Security Scorecard is working with the top nine cyber insurance. They are all using Security Scorecard right, to help drive the underwriting process. So they're using security ratings to understand your security risk and using that data to then underwrite your premium. So if you have a good rating, you will have a pretty good score or you will have a pretty good premium. If you have a not so good rating, uh, your security insurance company may come back to you and ask you to improve your scores uh, before they, they discuss further premium uh, negotiations as well. So if we if we kind of look at it um, from different perspective as well, one platform, multiple different use cases as well. Really useful, really good way to understand your own risk and how do they impact your organization as well. So how then do we leverage? So I mentioned right, it's a good way to present to the board. So how do we leverage ratings, security ratings? when reporting to our board or executive peers. So if we think about the three functions of a board, they are really looking at three key areas, the governance of our organization, the strategy, so the captain of the ship, or rather they are, they are the, the navigators of the ship that teaching the captain where to steer, and they hold the accountability of organizations. So security ratings in many informational security tools are scaled from one through five, with five being the most critical, some systems will use um, DEF CON as a way to, to identify the defense readiness condition and the reverse where DEF CON 1 is the maximum alertness and readiness where DEF CON 5 is normal and peacetime. So let's back up, up. Let's back up and explore a few other definitions first uh, before we talk about the dimensions and measure of risk. So when we kind of look at it to the board, <laughs> it, it tends to be interesting, right? Because that that's a that's a very big disconnect between the technical and the non-technical. So if a CISO presenting the board, they might have uh, presented that we deployed a blinky box for sin flood mitigation on our production network. Who understood that, right? So um, if if a CFO, you will you position it in a way that we spent X dollars to RK on the product that can prevent a four million dollar revenue loss. Right, so this would make a lot more sense for the non-technical, uh, non-cybersecurity trained executives. So if you want your message to resonate, you need to speak the language, right? You need to be able to communicate across in terms that they understand. A to F, universally understood. If you can put numbers to it, cyber risk notification, uh, and that's the ability that we can deliver as well. So 
if we if we look at the other dimension, which is about resilience, uh, resilience is sometimes defined as object's ability to return to its normal shape after being subjected to force or extreme conditions. So this term is important because it, it comes from the engineering use of tensile strength and ductile properties. Um, so it's important because recently, uh, pretty much every organization is being breached, right? So, so it's about the ability to bounce back. And it's now being adopted as part of our ability to be robust, adaptable, and transformable for organizations. So the term that's recently come up is called cyber resilience. It's a very recent incarnation of the term. And we can do well to understand its use in other, <coughs> excuse me. And we can do well to understand its uses in other domains uh, and education as well as war, right? So uh, in, in the Chinese proverb, a tree is unbending, is easily broken, right? So it means that uh, if the tree hits, or rather if there's a strong wind in a strong tree, the tree will easily uh, collapse as well, right? So, so the idea here is that it, it's all about these three key points, robustness, adaptability, and transformability. So it brings about a degree of diversity uh, as it brings about additional resilience for organizations. So if we, if we kind of look at it, so how then do we bring all that together, right? How do we communicate to the board? Where are we right now? Where are we headed? And where do we want to be? So the ability now is now to be able to, to have that insights, right? To be able to contextualize that business problem to answer internal questions that are really critical. So how do I then bring all that data? How do I demonstrate my efficacy and the return of investments of my security program? And what metrics do I use to track my server performance as well? So the reporting is now made easy. Security ratings platforms like us, Security Scorker, uh, have released multiple reporting centers, uh, different types of reports that it can leverage on to be able to demonstrate that. And it helps to also simplify the way to prioritize remediation efforts because you can now track where am I right now and where do I want to be? You're able to develop what we call plans to be able to identify the lowest hanging fruit, flick those and show an improvement in terms of ratings, both internally and externally. And you will be able to then understand and demonstrate that in a competitive benchmarking view, right? You can put yourself as a benchmark and compare yourself against your peers or your competitors to help your board and your executive team have insights across the industry. And that also delivers that trending perspective, right? So whether trending of my own entity, are there gaps, am I improving better over time? My subsidiaries, my partner ecosystems, and at the same time, what are the trends we're seeing in the landscape as well? So how does your organization leverage ratings and interactions? So we've seen different customers use ratings in different ways, right? They could uh, generate different types of reporting where they're using this kind of reports to be able to uh, pull out specific events like malware that they're seeing, uh, feature functions that they have, they're using the NIST framework, the, the identify, protect, detect, respond, recover, and they're mapping it against that. We've also seen companies using security ratings to understand the riskiest business partners versus the safest business, having the safest business practices, right? They're looking at all the vendors, the partners that they're working with, by like ranking them, looking at where the ratings and taking necessary actions, including um, disembarking a particular vendor from the organization. We've also seen organizations then combine what we see externally and what they're doing in terms of vulnerability management. So they're using security ratings as a way to hunt across the attack surface, where are the gaps, and then do a penetration testing against that particular issue that we're seeing and be able to close off all of these low-hanging fruits that attackers are all leveraging on uh, across these days as well. So if we kind of look at the case studies towards security rates, it is pretty helpful, right? So we have uh, a fair bit of customers across the world. We have about 30,000 cu 30, customers across the world that's using security scorecard. Uh, Truephone is one of the telcos that are using us. We, we have uh, the top nine telcos all using security scorecard as well, where this is from the CISO, 
And they're saying that they, they he used to spend hours creating reports and for the board presentation. And with security scorecard, it just takes a couple of seconds to pull the same information. They're also using security ratings as a way to give assurance to the customers that they're continuously monitoring their own organization, their own score, and be able to use it as a, a positioning for the organization to gain competitive advantage as well. We see a media company using security scorecard as a, using it in a similar way. So this is the CISO uh, from Horizon Media. Uh, they're using security scorecard to differentiate themselves in the marketplace. They're also doing a lot of integrations across the organization. Uh, and that's a big part of our play. We have the largest amount of integrations available out of the box. So we can speak with your tools and you can automate that journey within the organization. And as a program mature, security scorecard becomes really useful in different perspectives. And that's where the different use cases we cover coming from. Understanding not just your own risk, but at the same time, understanding your third party risk and what risk do they bring to your organization. Using that to collaborate with the third parties, using that to share a common language so that you have easy way, easier way to prioritize vendor assessments and figure out the depth that you know, go with the vendor. And that's exactly what RMS here uh, did with the platform as well. So as a very quick uh, summary of what we do, uh, you will see that security ratings has a multitude and supports a multitude of different use cases uh, for the management of cyber risk lifecycle. You will see that security ratings can be used in a different, uh, used as a competitive differentiator for your business to gain trust with your customers and you'll be able to help them understand your existing risk and be able to show mark improvements over time. Security ratings also simplify the languages that you use with internal and external stakeholders, and it helps you and your CISO uh, be able to easily demonstrate progress and justify additional investments. So this is really important because a lot of companies, they do use security ratings or security scorecard in general to help them position to the board about their needs. So for example, uh, they, will, they might have a lot of outdated web browsers and operating systems because they don't centrally manage the endpoints. So they, because we could see it externally without the need to install any data, it expressed the need for, uh, for them to control the endpoints. And they brought this need to the board and asked for additional investments to procure endpoint management solutions as well. So at the same time, security ratings can also be transformed into a revenue generating business, uh, especially for large telco providers, as we saw uh, earlier with Truefone. They're using security ratings as a way to provide assurance. They're using security ratings as a way to define where, how are they performing and showing that they're taking care of their own security. And at the same time, last but not least, is that security ratings do help balance out the asymmetric nature of our battle with hackers because it helps you understand and gain visibility into blind spots that our vendors and ourselves may not know before. And it helps you to proactively then reduce the respective attack surface because as you fix all the slow hanging fruits, you're reducing your attack surface and making it much harder for attackers and bad guys to be able to leverage the platform as well. Oh, sorry, to be able to leverage those loopholes to get into organizations. And with that, I'm going to quickly jump into our platform and show you how all of this works as well. So as you can see from this uh, platform right here, this is what a ratings, what's, what a scorecard looks like, right? So this is off the case scorecard, and this is what a scorecard looks like. So this is the live scorecard. It's really easy to look up our organization uh, and we'll show you all the details as well. So before we go into the details, I'd like to start off with what we call the digital footprint. So the digital footprint is effectively how Security Scorecard understands what makes up our organization. So Security Scorecard, what we do is that we go out across the whole internet, we scan the whole internet uh, to collect two data sets. One is what we call attribution, uh, the process is called attribution to understand the IP addresses and domains that make up our organization. And number two, what are the issues around that IP and domain itself 
and be able to then map that back to organization. So step one, attribution is the IPs and domains. We're able to understand that based on a few factors of data. So as you can see, uh, you will see all of the IP listing that security scorecard sees of our company. You'll be able to see uh, the detection mechanisms. Uh, you'll be able to see additional data of the IP itself. We drew down to the details. You can see that this IP was attributed to this company because there was an SSL cert, right? That had this particular name to it, right? And you can see the validity of it uh, and so forth. Uh, you can also see the issues that we're seeing of the organization right, that's arising from this particular IP. So in this case, there's a couple of outdated web browser, operating systems, and we see a certificate that's, that was using GoDaddy uh, as a way to generate the certificate. So once we collect all this data, and this is pretty much data analytics, um, what we do is that we use and apply machine learning to enhance the accuracy uh, and normalize that data. So normalization is based on three things, the quantity of the event, the severity of the issue, and the number of IP addresses that organization has. So how big the footprint size of this company is. So you measure equally to other companies. So if you have a million IP addresses, you're compared to a cohort of companies that also has a million IP addresses. So with that, all that data, we then compile that, we score it. A to F is how we score it. A is good, F is not good. Percentile map to it. So 90 to 100%. Will be an A, 80 to 90% will be a B, 70 80% is a C, anything below 60% will be an F. And an F will be 7% times more likely to have a data breach than a company that's caused an A. So we show you that all that data, we also break it into the 10 areas of risk that we measure against. We call them different factors. So immediately you can see where are the issues that I need to prioritize? So you can see it's pretty good here in terms of social uh, indicators, uh, but there's a couple of areas in terms of IP reputation and in terms of endpoint security, network security that I probably want to focus on and some secondary areas that I may want to look at uh, slightly later as well. So prioritization. So even though we say 10 different areas of risk, the severity of issues, the criticality of issues uh, can be seen when you break it down even further as well. So you will see that every issue that we look at is all classified as high, medium, and low severity. There's also positive and informational data that does not impact the rating, but it's still really good to take a look at it. So while we say 10 factors, we're in fact looking at about 160 different issues in total, and you can drill down further into the findings as well. So. One of the key areas in terms of, let's say, network security, we are looking at the ports and services, the certificates, as well as um, protocols and cipher suites as well. So what port and services would indicate things like RDP, uh, we see public facing MySQL and so forth. And by the way, all the data you're seeing here is based on publicly observable events. There's nothing whatsoever in there that requires you to deploy an agent, or requires you to install anything. Nothing whatsoever you have to install. Security Scorecard is a software as a service, SaaS platform. Simply log in and you have access to all of this. Nothing to deploy. And you have the same level of visibility into other organizations as well and as you build out a third-party risk program. So for example, we, we looked at MySQL service earlier. We can drill down into it further. Right? So if you're looking for more details, you would be able to drill down into the information. For example, and you can see here, we say that MySQL service is publicly observable. You will see a description. You will see the risk. You will see recommendations on how to fix it and external references uh, for you to read more about the issue as well. So in this case, uh, MySQL, which is a database, we see it publicly exposed on this company, but how many others do we see the same thing as well? So that's where the statistics come into play. This is where we get it from the normalization as we, as we go through. And you will see that of all the companies that this IPG photonics is measured against, 20% of them have this issue. So one fifth. And of the 20% of the companies that this company is measured against, how many findings on average and how many findings from this company? So slightly below average, but they are in the minority. 
right? So it's, it's still being flagged against them. And you would then see the full details. So in this case, when I say full details, you will see the full IP and port, where, where is it happening? What are we seeing? So my SQL and the version number, and when do we see this data? So in this case, last observed timestamp. The best part about this is that you have the ability to dispute the data as well. So for example, you have you are able to immediately provide feedback by checking the item, say that you have already resolved this, or if you have a comparison control, you have, uh, or you think that this is a false positive as well. So all of this, we do accept it. Provide a reason to why you think it's that way. So if you fix it, it's good, right? If you want to track it, provide a couple of uh, data here uh, for how you remediated that particular issue. So once you click submit, it takes a couple of hours for us to just recheck. And once we agree, that means we no longer see an issue, uh, we will give back the points that's adapted relevant to this particular issue. So you will see that all of this is really transparent, right? And it's a couple of days, right? You'll see your score going up, right? So you don't need to take weeks, you don't need to take months, right, for this to, to happen. It's just a couple of days to show that you're improving over time as well. And it's really transparent in the way that we're showing you exactly how does each issue we're measuring you against the findings we're seeing as well. How does each different issue impact your organization? So in this case, we can see for this company, there are a couple of areas here, operating systems, web browsers, that are almost 10 point each, and there's malware infections and adware that's also severely impacting this company as well. So as you, as you can see here, there's one button here that says proposed score plan. That's what our forecasting to. Right? There are two ways to really go about it. You can say that uh, I see that I'm currently at F grade and I want to improve my score to a D grade. So I can then simply just say that I want to move it to an A grade. I don't want, to, I don't want just to be a D, I want to be an A. So once you prove that, you can say generate a plan and the system will then propose to you what can you do to improve the score as well. Alternatively, if you, if you have an idea or inkling to focus on certain issues, you can use this as a forecasting tool as well. So what you can do is that you can say that, let's say I want to measure my outdated web browser, operating systems, my malware infection, and adware. So in a drag and drop kind of concept here, you will see that if I work on these four issues, I will move from an F grade at 45% to a C grade at 73%. Right? So it's a pretty good improvement just working on four different issues. And that can be my halfway mark, right? So I work on this, for issues, maybe by the end of uh, next month. So we're nearer to the end of month. So maybe my end of next month and the next uh, couple of issues as well to get to my A grade uh, in the following month as well. So by the end of this quarter, I can become an A grade, right? So there are remediation efforts you can take and be able to then have that reflected within the platform. So the next question here will be accuracy, transparency of the data as well. So. We are, as a case scorecard, really transparent. So transparency is one of the motto uh, because we believe that trust begins with transparency. So if you head over to our trust portal, which is available here uh, at trust.securityscorecard.com, you will see our site here, which gives you a white paper that discusses our methodology, even the formulas that calculate a score as well. Uh, if you go into that, it will show you exactly what do we look at, how frequently do we look at it, and how long does it stay on the scorecard, as you can see right here as well. Uh, there's a couple of discussion points here around what do a score mean? How do we do a measurement? How do we do a calculation? So as we go through this document, you will see uh, the steps that we take in order to build this mechanism. Uh, and it's important, again, historical data, right? The longer a company has been around and has been looking at it, the more historical data they would have. And if you have more historical data, the more correlation you can build. So that's exactly what security scorecard comes in from. So as you go through this, you can see uh, a lot of different data that we, we have published transparently and publicly. Anyone can look at it and anyone can evaluate this data point as well. But aside from just this, we, don't, we also go out and show you how many companies do we have. And we have about 12.1 million companies and scorecards that we have in our library. We can generate scorecards of any company within five to 10 minutes. It's a really quick way to evaluate companies 
especially new companies that we've not seen before, very quick way to evaluate where they are. And we show you our data accuracy as well. So when companies are telling us that we get our data wrong, it show you how quickly do we refute, how many, what's the percentage of refute here that companies are telling us and how quickly do we refute. And we also show you our attribution, misattribution as well. So again, we're really transparent in a way that we reflect our data. We believe strongly in transparency. So if you're looking to, to look for a security ratings provider, uh, consider us because we are very transparent and look at other organizations in terms of how transparent they are, in terms of how do they measure organizations. Uh, you can also see the number of security issues we're seeing week on week as well. It's, it is getting very frightening. Uh, there's a lot of geopolitical conflicts that we're seeing a lot of this coming from as well. Uh, and this is uh, really interesting as we go through this as well. So we see really the whole internet in really good depth and we're able to provide that in a simplified manner, A to F ratings. How did each different issue impact a company? And it's not just that. We show you historically how has a company been performing. So up to 12 month historical view of that organization. So for those of you familiar with the Okta Bridge, this company here that I'm showing you was the one that was, was, was uh, blamed for it in a way. Uh, you can see the historical data points as well. And if we look at the patching, they're pretty on the mark on the ball for it. But if we look at the endpoint security, breach happened around this period. You can see that consistently underperforming, not so good. After the breach, sudden flurry of patching. Right? So you can see the sudden uptick right there. And as you see, as I scroll through this and highlight certain timeline, there's a full event log right below that changes accordingly. So I can say, I want to look at everything. My event log changes accordingly as well. And there's different filters for me to look at uh, the details in further greater detail as well. And you will see again, it's very transparent. How does each different issue impact the organization on which day you can drill down to the issue you can look at the findings, you can understand it. And if this is your vendor, for example, this is my critical vendor, I can now you know, sort of invite my vendors into the platform. They get it for free. There's no uh, cost to you whatsoever. They get it for free. Uh, and you can also define expectations with them. So you can say that, okay, you are my critical vendor. I want you to maintain a certain grade within a certain number of days. And uh, you can re-invite them automatically after X days if they didn't accept the initial invitation as well, right? So what this does is that it builds that collaboration with your third parties, help them understand the risk that they have that they're bringing to your organization and be able to leverage that to communicate effectively. There's a common language now, right? About issues that you're concerned with, areas that you're concerned with and things that they, they themselves are exposing publicly. Right, that you can look at without the need to ask for permission, without the need to do a questionnaire, without the need to request for information as well. Right, So this, this is the depth and ability that security ratings brings to the table, security scorecard can bring to the table as well. So aside from that, we do quite a fair bit of mapping to compliance frameworks as well. So compliance frameworks that we support at this one time will be GDPR, HIPAA, ISO 2001, NIST, Cybersecurity Framework, uh, PCI DSS, SIG, right? Just to name a few of them, right? And it's really simple. All I have to do is just a click, click, and it will then show up on my scorecard. And I can see whether this organization has any gaps trying to meet a certain compliance. So in this case, I'm looking at a slightly older version of PCI DSS because this is easier to look at. Uh, so if we look at and drill down to this company, you can see that uh, they do have a fair bit of issues that we probably want to look at. Um, there's one here that says to, to install critical patches within one month of release. There's two findings on high severity vulnerabilities. If we drill down to that, you can see that some of these vulnerabilities has been there for since 2018, right? So it, it, it could be some time since they patch, right? They, you might want to drill down to it, you might want to speak with them, and it's all Nginx uh, in this case, and that, that can be something that can be worked on as well. So. That's really the capability, right? So you're able to see in depth and we don't just stop there, right? So you can see the pattern about how this is going. We can even show you at the same time, the depth of this company, the third and fourth parties that this organization is leveraging on, 
again, fully based on publicly observable data. So we show you the third parties that this company is leveraging on, the fourth parties, how are they being scored, even down to the product level of a company. So what products are this company exposing to the internet? We can see it, right? So that's the interesting part of it. So we know this company is using Sixth Sense. They're using a fair bit of Adobe products. We can see they're using a Carmine, Amazon, right? There's a couple of Apple devices in the organization. Azure as well, so multi-cloud. We know they're using multi-cloud. Uh, they, they have blue code and so forth, right? So these are things that we see publicly of organizations. We're able to correlate all the event into what we call a scorecard. It helps you to understand not just yourself, what are you exposing, but at the same time, what are your third parties exposing? And that delivers the risk that they are bringing to your organization and be able to impact the organization in that way as well. So we're able to deliver all of that, including at the same time, the ability to convert that risk into dollar and cents as well. So, so in terms of what we saw earlier, right, uh, the CFO will be talking in dollar and cents in monetary values, whereas the CISO may be communicating in a technical uh, conversation. So this will now bridge the two. You'll be able to look at the, the financial impact to organizations based on certain attack types, based on different threat actors, and based on certain refinement of it. So for example, your revenue and the industry, and you'll be able to see if this particular attack does happen, conducted by this event, uh, what will be the number of records that is estimated to be lost, what's the probability of this happening, how frequently will it happen, and what will be the financial impact to the company. You will also see uh, more data sources as well. Like for example, if it's ransomware by a cyber criminal, what would I be able to do to help me reduce my impact as well? And this helps deliver two things. One, a clearer message right now about where am I right now? And what are the losses that are estimated if this event does happen? What's the likelihood of impact to my company? Number two, is then looking at the protections that a company has. Do I have cyber insurance? Does my cyber insurance cover me for this event? So for example, some cyber insurance today no longer covers if you do ransomware payment, right? They will not cover ransomware payment. There may be additional riders that you have to get. For example, if this is an act of war, right? If they classify this as a wet act of war because it's, it's cyber war, right? So look at what you have right now, your protections. Would that cover you sufficiently uh, when this does impact, when this, when this event does happen as well? So two ways to do it. One, for reporting, to understand the impact and the likelihood of events, security events happening. Number two, am I sufficiently covered uh, for this particular event as well? So with all that data, you would then also be able to go down the, the deep end if you want to do threat hunting as well. So we do have and expose our database uh, for threat hunters as well. So if you're looking at, for example, an organization, you'll be able to see connections between organizations and threat actors. You'll be able to see the attribution data of organizations uh, of who owns that IP, for example. You'll be able to see the ports and services that open the scan, the raw scan results if you want to dig deeper. You'll be able to see the connections between vulnerabilities and those vulnerabilities that are leveraged by threat actors as well. So for example, so if I look up, let's say, for example, chinamobile.com, right? So for those of us who's been in cybersecurity for some time, uh, and if you have done red teaming or threat hunting before, uh, China Mobile is a gateway <laughs> for, for Chinese uh, threat actors as well. So, so you'll be able to see exactly across an organization the number of IPs we're seeing, and as a telco, this would make sense, right? 60 million IPs. Uh, you will be able to see the IPs that are attributed to, who are they attributed to? You'll be able to see the threat actor connections as well. So this IP is related to a threat actor. The different threat actors involved, whether they are ransomware group, whether they are just a simple APT. Uh, in this case, it looks like red, uh, red-based uh, kind of threat actor other vulnerabilities, malicious reputation, or active infection on that particular IP. You see the open port, the service that's running on it, looks like a JS, JavaScript uh, uh, site that is most likely uh, a, a C2, right? So a command control interface. 
So you again, IP based in Thailand, you can see where, where this is, you can see uh, where it's connected to. Uh, it's related to a few organizations here, a uh, couple of ports open, again, TCP rep, there's a Mirotic bandwidth test server uh, right there. Again, CoreJS is also enabled in that particular interface. And as you go through this, you'll see that we also cover the top products that we're seeing uh, being leveraged and we see across the internet. You'll see the top organizations that are uh, having affiliation to track actors. You will see the ports, the top ports uh, that are open across the internet. The varieties that we're seeing as uh, uh, the most across the internet, uh, as well as the actors and locations across as well. So it's not just a simple search like this. You will be able to go really, really deep. So if you have used Shodan before, this will be a hybrid of that, right? So we build our own interface, we build our own data, we collect our own information, we collect much faster than Shodan does and in greater depth as well. So if you're looking at ports, you can look up by track actor connections. Shodan doesn't do that. You can look at um, uh, attribution data of organizations. You can look out for certain events, industries. Uh, you can look out for by varieties. You can look for OS types uh, that are not AWS, uh, GCP, or Azure. Uh, you'll be able to look up by country, by device type, and so forth. All right. So if you look at Shodan before, Try this out. This is really effective. It's a much deeper sense of what Shona can deliver as well. So as you can see, Security Scorecard is not just a simple ratings platform where while security ratings is our primary business itself and we're the best at it, by the way. So Forrester ranks us as number one. Forrester ranks us as number one. Uh, if you look at Gartner Peer Insights, uh, we're so highly rated by our customers as well. right? And that's something that we deliver to all customers um, and, and we are always constantly evolving and innovating to deliver the best service that we can for our customers as well. So security ratings in general helps, to helps you to understand risk that the company is exposing. So we go a mile wide and an inch deep, but it gives you the exposure that a company has, the risk that they're presenting out, the low hanging fruits that we can close right, to reduce our tech surface. The same visibility can be applied to all my third parties, be it from my tier one, tier two uh, vendors, where I can rank them in different portfolios and different groupings like this. Uh, I'm able to zoom in into the companies and be able to understand what are the critical issues, how do they break down a distribution perspective and common issues. So of the companies I'm monitoring here, half of them have high severity vulnerabilities. Hey, interesting. So you'll be able to then zoom in and see, are they improving over time, declining over time, or are there gaps and outliers here that are dropping rapidly in the last 30 days? And you'll be able to zoom in and out and understand the risk that this company presents to you. So security ratings does that really, really well. Security scorecard is the top of the game, and we're able to deliver that as a service for our organizations as well, for our customers here. Uh, and if you're interested in getting more details and more data, you can look at the third and fourth parties of companies that are related to them down to the product level that they're leveraging. You can look at it from a financial dollar value. How does a certain event happen to your organization? But if you're looking to do, let's say, threat hunting, uh, we do open up our databases for, for a fee and you'll be able to use that and leverage that as part of your threat hunting repository and tool sets as well. And if you're looking to do, let's say, rate teaming, tabletop exercises, pen testing, Security so Scorecard has those services that we can offer as part of our solution as well. And with that, uh, I thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, I see that the, the questions, uh, there was one question that has been answered. We do GDPR mapping, uh, and that's something that we deliver within the platform. Ah, one other thing. So, Aside from the ability to, to show you all of that within the platform, multiple ways to generate reports, right? So be it from a board perspective, be it from a comparison, benchmarking, or to look at trends, there's different ways to look at it, right? So we, we propose and we, we give you a fair bit of different types of reporting. If you're looking to integrate with different tool sets as well, right, we, we would be able to deliver a wide variety of different solutions. So let me just uh, hop on to a different slide deck and show you that, that list of things that we do. So you can see here the different things that we support. 
Third party risk tools like ServiceNow, RC Archer, Coupa, OneTrust. Uh, if you're looking to integrate with a SOL architecture, we support Palo Alto Cortex uh, natively. If you're looking to do correlation with your, with your SIM, like a Splunk and Curator, we support that as well. If you're looking to build workflow automation, for example, automatically creating a Jira ticket, notifying you on Microsoft Teams, that is all something that we support out of the box natively as well. And on top of this, there's also an API layer that we support um, open API layer that we support, and you're able to build your own perspective and integration. So we have a couple of customers that we work with that are exactly exporting the data into Microsoft Power BI and building their own dashboards and, and reporting formats uh, for their board of directors as well. We support all of that. And with that, thank you very much for joining us. Apologies, I jumped in again later earlier, uh, but if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them into the chat. Uh, into the, the Q&A section right now. So at, at this point of time, so at this point of time, uh, we, we don't natively support with uh, Sunset uh, tools as well. Uh, but what we do is that, sorry, let me just jump back to the original slide earlier, right? So we don't we don't have a direct uh, uh, support to Thursday tools, but we do have an open API. So so you would be able to build your own perspective and views into an organization. So let me show you how that would work. Um, you will be able to access what we call um, API reference, which we'll provide for free as well. And you'll be able to access all the endpoints that we support as part of our API. We do have a fair bit of languages that we support, right? So, but ultimately it's all about um, API connections, HTTPS, uh, and you will receive a JSON response. So as long as your app, your tool will be able to support that, uh, you'll be able to gain that visibility as well. So I see a second question, how to collect data and generate report for cloud and SaaS. Great question. Uh, we already do that. <laughs> so, so you would be able to look up any company simply by typing in domain name. So for example, if I want to look up, let's say Intel, right? Intel, which is a chip manufacturer, I can simply just type in a domain name like this and do a search and I will have the scorecard. Are you still in presentation mode for your PowerPoint? You need to show oh, I'm, it. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So um, this was the earliest, uh, slide I was talking about where we do have an open API, you will have a different reference uh, and you will be able to see all the different references and all the different languages that we, we, we provide as part of offering. Uh, basically what you get is a JSON response and as long as your app uh, is able to receive that, that's all good. Okay, so next question was about uh, generating cloud uh, data. So we already supported natively uh, we are looking at organizations. So you're able to just simply search, for example, Office 365, right? Office 365, right? I'm able to look at Office 365, I'm able to click in, look at the ratings of Office 365 um, versus maybe Microsoft, right? So I can see all of that. Uh, it's all available already on the platform. Uh, you just have to type in a domain name and you can see the ratings as well. So if I, myself, my company has a cloud platform or cloud, um, uh, cloud-based um, infrastructure. Security scorecard would automatically be able to see it. We'll be able to collect the data right? because we are looking at a fair bit of different sources of information. We're looking at who is records. We're looking at uh, uh, DNS. We're looking at SSL certs uh, to, to get all this data, including cloud platforms as well. So we are looking at cloud platforms. This is a major differentiator for us uh, automatically. So all the major cloud platforms uh, GCP, Oracle, Azure, and AWS, we're automatically collecting the data, able to automatically attribute it to a company and be able to then uh, score it according to, to our, the way that we, we have our different factors as well. So next question I see is uh, what's different from Tenable? Uh, you would have to define a question a little bit. Tenable has a lot of solutions, but I'm assuming that you're looking at it from a boundary assessment or pen testing perspective. So uh, Ruby assessment itself, um, or rather tenable or qualis for the matter, Ruby assessment itself, 
typically is a scope-based assessment for your own organization. So let me define that a little bit. So when I say scope-based, it means that you have to define what IP or IP ranges I'm scanning or what domains or what applications I'm scanning. Right? So typically, virus assessment or pen testing for the matter, you, you define that. And you can only do it for your own company. You can't do it for other organizations unless you have the authorization. Security ratings is different. You can look up security ratings on any company. It is a bigger context than just vulnerabilities because we, we, we are looking at different, different data points as well. Things like ransomware, things like endpoint data, malware information, whether there were information that's linked, hacker channel, social stuff uh, around a company. Yes, there's slight overlaps. It does of patching and it does of network application security that can be picked up by maybe Tenable. Uh, but if you take a look at it uh, from a, let's say, healthcare scenario, security scorecard is like going to a doctor every year for your health checkup, right? So you go to a doctor for a health checkup, the doctor is saying, oh, maybe your pulse rate is quick, your pressure is a bit high, and so forth. So big breath, but less depth. Rabbit assessment will be more depth, right? So it's like an x-ray. You're scanning a certain body part, right? So maybe my arm, I, I felt a lump, I'm going for an x-ray. And that lump may be, uh, may be seen on x-ray uh, and that will be similar to a bar BT, right? So I see a CVE, I'm scanning for that. I will then do a pen testing, a penetration testing, which I will then exploit the bar BT to see if I can do remote code execution or inject data or exfiltrate data, right? So it'll be like a biopsy. So I'll take a piece of that lump, test it for cancer. So same kind of concept. Security ratings bigger in breadth, smaller in depth. Whereas pen testing is smaller in breadth and deeper in depth. So, so that's where the difference uh, comes in as well. And by the way, we are partners with Tenable as well. Right? So, so uh, there's a, a partnership that's ongoing uh, that can give you a, a better pricing on solutions as well. Uh, next question is about IoT. Great question. So we, we do support IoT, but basically we are now only looking at IPv4 space. Uh, we are looking at it primarily from security controls uh, that are defined in a MITRE uh, attack framework or based on NIST cybersecurity fr security framework, um, where we are looking at the common issues, the low hanging fruits uh, that are publicly exposed. So we're looking at IPv4 mostly, and we're looking at it from a general security perspective, uh, and that's about the company rather than specific use cases as well. So the next question I see is, can can we check uh, DevOps, uh, DevOps or Dex setups? Unfortunately not. So um, we don't look at it from the internal controls of a company, neither do we uh, explore whether there are gaps within organization. What we do is that we look at a company from an external perspective, nothing to deploy, nothing whatsoever, based on what we are exposing publicly, on the external perspective, on how are they performing from a security standpoint. So. Specifically to, to SecOps or DevSecOps, uh, we do look at it from an application security perspective, where we're looking at the web applications that the company has exposed publicly. So, so we are looking at it from uh, different factors, like things like, do you use HTTPS? Uh, do you have the proper headers like CSV, HSTS, um, X content type, X frame options? All of this are belonging to cross-site scripting protections as well. So this, these are things that we look at externally. And we also then look at, for example, if an organization has a copyright uh, that is not current. So for example, at the bottom of a, of a website, you will see that this website is uh, updated in 2000, right? So something is wrong there. It's been, it's been more than three, uh, 22 years and the website has been, hasn't been updated. So, so you know that this company doesn't really take their own uh, website seriously. Uh, it's their brand name, they're not, they're not controlling well. Uh, and that's something a, a sense that we're delivering. We don't score that particular factor, but we do show it to you like this, right? Uh, whether the website is current or not current. So next question here I see is, um, what if we use Cloudflare? Great question. Uh, we, we effectively measure a whole company uh, regardless of whether you use Cloudflare, Akama, and so forth as well. Uh, we're looking at it from IPs and domains that the company own based on a few factors, things like who is SSL cert DNS. So regardless of whether you use Cloudflare or Akamai, your SSL cert will present itself 
right, as your attribute. So the domain and IP associated to that as asset will be part of your assets that we use to evaluate. And we do this really, really frequently. So for cloud-based assets, we do it multiple times a day. For uh, physical IPs as well, we pretty much do it every day, right? To be able to understand if there are existing risks, if things should be taken out of, uh, taken out of the scorecard uh, and adjusted. So every scorecard, all the 12 million scorecards that we have right now are all updated daily. So every day you get fresh data, so regardless of whether you're using Akamai, Cloudflare, or any of the CDNs uh, to protect your websites, uh, we would be able to still see it uh, directly as well. Yeah, thanks for the question, right? And, and thanks thanks for thanking me, <laughs> right? So uh, those were all great questions. Uh, feel free to keep them coming. Uh, I'll stay on the line for, for a couple of more minutes. But thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, and and it's been a pleasure sharing all these details with all of you as well. Thank you, everyone. Okay, ครับอ่าผมเข้าใจว่าก็น่าจะหมดทุกคําถามทุกข้อสงสัยนะครับเอ่อถ้าเกิดว่าหลังจากนี้จะติดต่อคุณเอ่อทางทีมงาน Security Scorecard จะต้องทำยังไงบ้างครับคุณบิ๊กบิ๊กครับก็เดี๋ยวผมน่าจะมีในส่วนของ Business Development l a b นะครับโทรเข้าไปติดต่อทุกท่านเพื่อดูว่าทางเราเนี่ยจะช่วยสปอร์ตตรงนี้ได้ยังไงเราอาจจะมีในส่วนของ POC หรือ POV หรือสนใจตรงไหนเพิ่มเติมซึ่งทางเราเนี่ยจะมีทางคุณ A มานะครับโทรติดต่อเข้าไปครับผมหรือว่าสามารถที่จะนะครับอีเมลถึงทางผมได้ที่ผมให้อีเมลไว้นะครับ Uh, b i w l y b i l l y w นะครับ at security scorecard dot i o ซึ่งเดี๋ยวทางทีมงานสามารถส่งให้ได้ไหมครับส่งให้ผู้เข้าฟังได้ไหมครับได้ครับผมยังไงคุณบิลลี่สามารถพิมพ์เข้าทางช่องแชทให้ทุกคนได้เลยนะครับตอนนี้ใช่ไหมครับโอเคแป๊บหนึ่งนะครับแล้วก็จะมีในส่วนของแป๊บหนึ่งนะครับเบอร์มือถือผม0856496888นะครับอ uh, I think you need to post it to every... sorry I think you need to post it to everyone I think you're only posting it to the host and panelists uh there is no everyone it's only oh. TikTok yeah, that... or it and Han ah thank you for that <laughs> I mean uh, I mean I just said yeah okay ครับก็น่าจะได้อ่าได้เดสกันไปแล้วนะครับเอ่อผมเข้าใจว่าในถ้าเกิดว่าใครอยากทดลองจะมีตัวหน้าเว็บใช่ไหมครับที่ลองกันได้ถูกไหมฮะอุลลี่ใช่ครับจะมีไปที่หน้าเว็บเลยครับดูในแง่ของเอ่อเดี๋ยวผมแชร์ให้ดูก็ได้ครับเห็นมีของผมไหมครับเห็นหน้าจอครับผมที่เป็น get your free instant report ครับเห็นครับเว็บไซต์เนี่ยครับเข้าไปแล้วก็สามารถเข้าไปขอนะครับ account ได้นะครับ free account sign up แล้วก็กรอกชื่อบริษัทนะครับชื่อตัวเองแล้วก็ชื่อบริษัทแล้วก็อีเมลเขาไปดูสกอร์ของบริษัทตัวเองได้เลยครับโอเคครับยังไงก็ลองกันดูนะครับแล้วยังไงก็ติดต่อกับทางคุณบิลลี่เข้าไปกันได้
โอเคถ้างั้นวันนี้ผมต้องขอขอบคุณทุกท่านนะครับที่สละเวลาเข้ามาในวันนี้แล้วก็ขอบคุณทีมงานในทาง Security Scorecard ที่มาให้ความรู้กันในวันนี้ด้วยครับยังไงหวังว่าจะได้เจอกันในโอกาสหน้านะครับสวัสดีครับขอบคุณทุกท่าน